Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, so now we're going to get started with the first uh, batch of student presentations. I just wanted to go over a few logistics before we get started. We will have um, four students will present back to back. Each student will have two and a half minutes to give their presentation. And then after each batch of four students, we'll have time for audience questions and answers. So you can type your questions in the chat window um, because we have so many students and so many presentations. Please keep your questions short and sweet. <laughs> Moderators Stephanie and I will read the question out to the students so they can answer it. Please, we beg of you, <laughs> preface your comment with the student's name when you type it into the chat window so that we can easily identify which questions belong to which students. So we make sure that we can divide the time amongst the students equally. For the students, if you have, if there's any technical difficulties and you lose your internet connection, we'll move on to the next speaker and we'll circle back to you once you've reconnected. So don't worry, but don't stress out about that. I just want to remind the students to fill out the peer evaluation form. Um, and don't forget to fill out the peer evaluation form for each of your fellow students, but also yourself and submit those during the Neil McKenzie Award uh, announcement at the end so that we can tally the results and figure out who is the People's Choice um, prize winner. And just as a reminder, Stephanie emailed you the link for that survey yesterday. Um, students, it would be great if you could turn on your camera and get ready uh, for your presentation while the person before you is speaking. And um, the list of speaker order was emailed to you as well. Remember to introduce yourself before starting your presentation. And I uh, would also like to invite the audience to participate in the People's Choice Award for their favorite speaker. And the link for that will be posted into the chat. And great. I think that is all the logistics that we need to cover. And so um, our first speaker we have is Adam Moleni. And so we can get started with him. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Adan Moleni. And today I'll be presenting my research this summer in the Biogmentated Interfaces Lab at iCord. Next slide. Looking at the figure on the left, injuries to the spinal cord cause paralysis in regions at and below the injury site. On the right, you can see these injuries result from damage to crucial fibers. These damaged fibers cannot spontaneously regenerate and grow back lost connections, hence why an intervention is needed to induce regeneration. Next slide. While neural cells naturally do not respond to light, researchers have isolated the genes of light-sensitive ion channels found in green algae. By using a virus containing these genes to induce their expression in neural cells, we can make them respond to light. This is the basis of optogenetics, a technique that has revolutionized neuroscience research primarily in the brain. However, the power of optogenetics has not yet been harnessed in the spinal cord, particularly when it comes to regeneration studies. The basis of this project is, is to sensitize nerve fibers in the spinal cord to light by injecting this virus, which is carrying the genes encoding for these light sensitive ion channels. Next slide. But what does this optogenetic technology have to do with regeneration following an injury to the spinal cord? Well, previous in vitro studies in which neural cells were sensitized to light using these light-sensitive ion channels found that cells expressing these light-sensitive channels grow significantly following exposure to light, as can be seen in figure A, as opposed to C and D, which do not have these channels, and B, which has a light-sensitive channel but is not being stimulated by light. Next slide. After we have sensitized these nerve fibers in the spinal cord to light, the end goal is to insert an LED light probe to activate these light sensitive fibers. We hope that the activa this activation with light will result in growth of damaged fibers, like what was observed in vitro. Next slide. All right, um, so before we get to that point, we need to ensure that these nerve fibers are sensitized to light in the first place. The confocal microscopy images I collected on the top right are cross sections of the spinal cord and the image on the bottom right is a longitudinal section with a zoomed in portion indicated by the red box. The light green fluorescence in these images is representative of these light sensitive channels. Based on these images, we have shown that this virus expression of this light sensitive channel is optimal for future work when proceeding to insert this LED probe, which was described in the previous video after creating spinal cord injury animal models to observe for regeneration. To end, I would like to thank the CBR and SBME for hosting this event and the Faculty of Medicine for funding my research this summer. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sorry about the technical issues. Um, we can get started with our next speaker. 
if we have slides. <laughs> Our next speaker should be Adrian. Yep. All right. yeah. Hello, Great. everyone. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Adrian. And this summer, I joined a project that focused on using AI to improve image guided spinal procedures. Next slide, please. So, as a bit of background, there are several medical procedures that require physicians to take CT scans of a patient's spine and find the appropriate location to operate on in advance. These include injections of pain medications and surgeries mostly. A common challenge here, though, is that it can be difficult to manually identify vertebrae, and there have been cases of procedures being done at the wrong spot. So to mitigate this risk and aid physicians in planning spinal procedures, our team is developing a machine learning algorithm to automatically identify vertebrae and other anatomical features on CTs. Next slide, please. So uh, the general type of AI we'll be using is known as a convolutional neural network. And it works by filtering CT scans to look for certain features from edges early on to specific vertebrae down the line. And after a few other steps, it outputs an image similar to what you see on the screen here, where the vertebrae are individually highlighted and labeled. Our neural network will undergo something called supervised learning, meaning that the image generated from the AI is compared to a ground truth, so essentially an image manually labeled by a human, which acts as an answer sheet for it to go back and tweak its approach to be more accurate. Next slide, please. So when working with convolutional neural networks, it's really important to have a huge data set, usually hundreds of CTs, each with hundreds of individual images. And uh, this needs to be curated quite uh, rigorously. And that was my main focus during the summer studentship. Uh, next slide, please. So when curating this data set, my first step was to review 374 open access CT scans from a data set called Verse and exclude any features that would confuse our initial neural network. So these are things like scoliosis and metal vertebral inserts. And after this initial review, we yielded about 212 CT scans for our initial AI. And the second step was to manually highlight and identify our included set slice by slice to create these ground truths. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, moving forward, our team will be training our neural network to label and identify vertebral levels on a spinal CT, then repeating this process again to train it to identify smaller anatomical features. And in the future, we're hoping to incorporate this neural network into a robotic arm being developed for needle-guided procedures. So uh, that's what it. Thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Great. Thank you so much. That was great. And our next speaker is Alexander. Hello, and welcome to my presentation on a high throughput thermal drawing power for the production of molten material fibers. I'm uh, Alex Gold, part of the Bioaugmentative Interfaces Laboratory, run by Dr. Dennis Shariari. So thermal drawing involves taking a precisely formed similar uh, cylinder of material called a preform, lowering it to a furnace and heating it to a softening temperature. Then by pulling the material from the bottom, we draw it out into long, thin fibers. The resulting fibers are very small, sitting at the nanometer scale. Uh, next slide, please. Like regular fibers, thermally drawn fibers are small thread-like structures, which are commonly used in fiber optic cable. However, unlike fiber optic cable, the fibers we wish to produce can only be, uh, can be made up of more than one material. One way we can do this is by combining the materials while making the preform, as seen in the lower image. We can prepare the multi-material fibers so that they have a metal core and can, and can uh, conduct electricity. Furthermore, by creating a hollow preform, we can create hollow fibers capable of delivering fluids. These two traits, make these fibers very appealing for probes, especially when considering their flexible nature. Although we can do quite a lot with these fibers, it's currently very difficult for laboratories to get a thermal drawing tower needed to make them, denying access to many who could use these fibers in their work. Next slide, please. This is where my summer project comes in. On the right is the current CAD of my thermal draw tower, which aims to be an easily accessible way to produce these multi-material fibers. To achieve the goal of easy accessibility, the tower is made of easy to find materials, such as T-slotted framing, requiring minimal machining. Additionally, if a laboratory wished to create one of these, they could do so with around $15,000 to $20,000, costing them much less than the conventional price around a million dollars seen by commercial towers. The tower aims to enable the creation of fibers from a variety of materials, allowing a wider range to be produced from a single tower. The tower also aims uh, to allow fine control of the fiber size through controlling three key areas. The first, uh, next slide, please. The first way uh, fiber size is controlled is through the temperature of the furnace, with hotter temperatures leading to thinner fibers. 
The furnace achieves this fine temperature control by taking advantage of the multi-zone design, allowing for the adjustment of temperature in three areas of the furnace. The temperature of the, of the furnace allows continuous flow of material through the heating zones while still maintaining optimal temperatures. Additionally, if other, uh, other peripherals such as an iris can be added to ensure even greater temper, uh, temperature stability. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other way uh, to control size is through adjusting either the feeding or the drawing speed. The drawing tile will be able to control the feeding speed uh, through a separate motor and a power screw to lower and raise the preform. A capstan and a spool allow for fine uh, control of the drawing speed as well as collecting, uh, collecting of the fibers. A precise control of temperature, feed, and draw speeds results in a tower with uh, uh, the uh, ability to produce finely tuned fibers, which, uh, with combined with the uh, great accessibility aims to provide, will allow for wider access to these fibers, opening the door for their use in further uh, studies. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Okay, great. And our, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Our next speaker is Alexandra. Good morning. My name is Alexandra, and today I will be presenting my summer research in the Prizedale lab, looking at mutant factor 10 as a safer alternative for clot busting therapy. Next slide, please. Heart attacks and strokes caused by blood clots require clot busting drugs as therapies. The clot busting process requires tissue plasminogen activator in red here to generate clot busting plasmin. For this reason, recombinant TPA has been used as the gold standard thrombolytic agent for nearly three and a half decades. Unfortunately, the high doses required can cause severe bleeding in as many as 6% of patients. To look into safer alternatives, the Prize Still Lab has focused their attention on a TPA accelerant, clotting factor 10, shown in blue. Not only does it accelerate the clot busting process, but it may use small enough doses to avoid the negative side effects. Next slide, please. Now, let's acknowledge that this is called clotting factor 10. Step one of our mutant synthesis required a mutation to inhibit factor 10's clotting activity. Step two required a mutation that would stabilize the protein, inhibiting its ability to degrade into an inactive peptide. After a long purification process, we were able to run the gel in figure two to see plasmin degrading wild type factor 10 into an inactive cofactor while our mutant remains stabilized. When we test our new cofactor on the bench, we can watch it dissolve blood clots much faster than wild type factor 10. This graph on the right is showing us turbidity over time, which is an inverse measure of how much light is getting through. When we form a clot, such as the one we initiated at time zero, Turbidity rises because light is not passing through that solid meshwork. As our mutant factor 10 in blue breaks down the clot, we can watch that line drop back to baseline. Next slide, please. In mouse models this week, we will be causing clot formation in the carotid artery and then treating the animals with either saline or our mutant factor 10. We expect our results to look similar to those with the gold standard TPA agent, Altaplase, which I'm showing here on the left. The amplitude in our graph decreases at 10 minutes when we cause clot formation, denoting low blood flow within the artery. When we give the mice a control saline injection on the left, blood flow stays low and the clot does not dissolve. When we give the mice our mutant factor 10, we will hopefully see similar data to those on the right with alteplase, suggesting reperfusion as our amplitude increases again. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Now we'll have a Q&A session for these last four speakers. Um, so we have a question in the chat for Aiden, who said, or Aiden, sorry, Aiden, right? Um, you mentioned that data showed the in vitro growth of nerve fibers following light sensitive ion channel stimulation. And Eric was wondering if similar optogenetically induced regeneration following spinal cord injury has already been shown in vivo. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, so the short answer is no. Um, no one has looked at optical, optically stimulating nerve fibers in the spinal cord um, to look for regeneration, but there has been groups that have tried to inject this optogenetic virus into the spinal cord, but they didn't have very much success. So pretty much no. no. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I don't see any other questions for other speakers, but I have one for um, Adrian. So I think you mentioned that there are some, um, uh, when you were looking at your spinal cord um, images there, you found some anatomical abnormalities in some of them that you ruled out scoliosis or other things, but some people have uh, extra vertebrae and other sort of pathologies. How, how are those factoring into your algorithm? Well, I'd say early on in the algorithm, we do need to, I guess, narrow how diverse the data set is just to make sure that some initial 
I guess, methods are hammered out and the algorithm is able to recognize it. But as for, um, as for extra vertebrae, that's usually something that with enough data, the algorithm can take in and make sense of early on. So uh, yeah, like I was saying, the main reason we excluded some pathologies was because it would have been too challenging for the preliminary neural network to make sense of. But later on, as we acquire more data and are able to expand how much we're able to pass through the algorithm, we'll be looking to account for that as well. Great. Um, okay, I don't see any questions for the other students. Oh, Alexandra, that's wrong. Uh, people are still typing. Um, are you able to describe the specific mutations it was that your mutant factor 10 has and why those were chosen? Um, I am not at liberty to discuss the exact mutations, um, but like I said, one of them is trying to ensure that we're not breaking down into the inactive peptide. So we're looking at a cleavage location um, and the other one is inhibiting its clotting activity. So that's all I can tell you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, um, we can move on to the next set of speakers, I think, and Stephanie will be moderating this round. All right, we'll start with Amanda. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Amanda Murphy, and I'll be presenting today on the recommendations for patient collected videos in automated behavior analysis. Next slide, please. So the problem is that currently telehealth is being used to try and increase accessibility of medicine, whether it be made inaccessible due to COVID-19, geography, or a variety of other issues. But now with the advent of smartphone taking video of patients at home, being sent to clinicians for their diagnoses, there's been an increase in video that has to be sifted through for clinicians, which is quite significant. Next slide, please. So an algorithm called HF Movements was created to try and identify by body segment when in the video movement is occurring. So you can see on the diagram here on the right-hand side, the green segments which show when movement is above a certain threshold to be made significant. And you can see on the left-hand side, the skeleton being imposed per body segment where these segments are. And this is being used to try and decrease the amount of time clinicians have to dedicate watching video so that they only have to look at these particular parts in green instead of the whole video. So the time goes from hours to minutes being dedicated to watching this. Next slide, please. So, however, while this is great, we need to find which, where video could actually be taken from so it is accurate enough. So, um, so video was taken simultaneously at uh, two different points, the baseline and otherwise, and accuracy was calculated using a Python script and HM movements to find that um, where what the accuracy was for each angle. So my project was dedicated to finding out at what angles, distances, and heights were most accurate. This was done by comparing these two videos um, and giving the information for to make the accuracy. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the findings were that video taken up further than one meter is better suited for use in HM movements and video taken within but not including 30 degrees is best. However, the video taken at one meter away and 30 and 45 degrees on the left-hand side, the participant had a decrease in accuracy due to errors in imposing the skeleton on the video, as you can see on the right-hand side here with the arm not being shown. And in the future, we'll be taking more video um, at these points to find whether or not it is truly the position that the video is being taken at, or if it is due to other factors that are decreasing the accuracy. Uh, thank you very much. Next speaker. Hi, I'm Arden. I'm a student at the Zach Smith Laboratory. And today I'll be going over the electrical simulation of engineered heart tissue. Just before I go to the next slide, I just want to showcase one of our engineered heart tissue that we've made in the lab, I'll show it on the right. So in the next slide, please. Um, so in order to make one of those tissues, we want to start off with a human-induced pluripotent stem cells. We then differentiate those into cardiomyocyte denoted as CM. These are basically your heart cell. Once you have those, you can integrate those into scaffolding to create your engineered heart tissue. 
So in a lot of studies, they've shown that integrating an electrical stimulation will allow you to get much better uh, tissue. However, in the market, a lot of the pulse scanner is quite expensive. They have an average cost of about $15,000. So the goal of my project is to build a cheap and novel dual voltage pulse generator for engineered heart tissue. So in the next slide, I'll show you um, how this is gonna be done. So I'm not gonna go into the actual build of the device, it's gonna be complicated. However, I will be going over one of the important engineering practices, which is validation. So in order to do this, we've done two tests. One is the voltage test and the other was the frequency test. In the voltage test, we just use a ordinary multimeter. However, in the frequency test, we used one of our engineered heart tissue, we put it in the microscope. We take a video of that, seeing how the tissues contract, and then take that video, put it into our custom algorithm. We then use that to extract valuable information, such as frequency. So next slide, I'll show you how the results have come together. So on the left-hand side, it shows you the voltage output. In a horizontal, it shows you the device voltage, while the vertical is the reading from the multimeter. As you can see, for each device voltage, there's two readings for the multimeter, and this just accounts for the dual voltage of the device. And one thing to note from this graph is also that the correlation, which is the R squared, is equivalent to one for each of the lines, which suggests that the device actually does produce the proper voltage. On the other hand, um, the left hand, the right hand graph shows the frequency output. Again, the horizontal is the device frequency, while the vertical is the tissue frequency. Um, you might notice that there might be a little bit of a variance. However, with all things taken into account, the very uh, the correlation is again pretty high at 0.99. So next slide, I'll show you the conclusion to this. So basically the device that we built in a lab does produce the proper pulse voltage and frequency. As for future work, we're hoping to incorporate this uh, device into looking at the effects of stimulation for disease and drug models. And thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I'll now pass it off to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi everyone, my name is Arian and I completed my summer project under the supervision of Nargis in the Divine Lab. Our lab has an ongoing focus in understanding the donor factors that contribute to the quality of blood products during storage to improve patient outcomes following blood transfusion. I investigated if laser optical rotational red cell analyzer, AKA Lorca can be used for this purpose. Next slide, please. Red blood cells possess a unique deformability so they can squeeze through small vessels to deliver oxygen to tissues. LORC has traditionally been used to detect hereditary membrane diseases by projecting a laser beam to capture the diffraction pattern of light in a suspension of red blood cells. The figure to the left shows how light is processed by a camera to calculate an elongation index, from which we can observe changes in red cell deformability when subjected to a shear stress or osmolality gradient. The figure in the middle shows the deformability curve, which collects the elongation index as a function of shear stress. The figure to the right shows osmoscan mode, which collects the elongation index as osmolality increases. Our focus was on three parameters. EI max is maximal deformability at isotonic osmolality, O min is the hypotonic osmolality where half of all red cells lies, and O hyper is the hypertonic osmolality where half of EI max is achieved. O hyper is also an indicator of red cell water content. Next slide, please. Our first objective investigated how sex, triglyceride levels, and age affected Lorca indices in various donors. The table on the top left shows EI max, O min, and O hyper stratified into male and female cell populations. It was determined that sex does not affect Lorca indices. The figure to the top right shows an association between maximum elongation and triglyceride levels in males. The figure below shows that EI max and O min are not significantly associated with age. To the right, we see an association between O hyper and age, suggesting that red cell intracellular water content increases with age. Next slide, please. Our second objective was to determine if the current lab method of measuring osmotic fragility can be replaced by OSMOSCAN, as the protocol is time consuming. The figure on the left shows red cells suspended in percentages of normal saline. The middle value of 0.45 is used to report hemolysis of red cells. The figure on the right shows that an association between Lorca's omen and percent hemolysis has yet to be determined. Next slide, please. Our third objective was to determine how storage time affects Lorca indices. Four red cell units were tracked over 42 days. The top left figure shows that there is a significant but normal increase in hemolysis as storage time increases. The top right figure shows that the maximum elongation index decreases as storage time increases. The bottom two figures show that OMIN and O-hyper do not change significantly with increasing storage time. Next slide, please. Our three objectives allowed us to determine a baseline of Lorca indices for future studies that investigate why storage outcomes vary in different donors summarized here. Thank you very much for your time.
Great. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next speaker. Good morning. Uh, my name is Atisha Jay, and I'm a co-op student in the Sastra Lab. It is my pleasure to talk to you about my project today, which involved the construction of an automated flow serve for in-situ biomolecular imaging. Next slide, please. Single cell RNA sequencing has been the gold standard for quantifying gene expression changes. However, one limitation of this protocol is the dissociation of tissue, which uh, contributes, uh, which prevents us from identifying the spatial location of gene expression, which for instance, could contribute uh, to the changes, uh, which contributes to the uh, inference of different uh, tissue structures in early human development. Fortunately, there are protocols such as fluorescent in-situ sequencing that allows us to interrogate the gene expression change while maintaining the structural uh, environment of these tissue structures. However, this protocol is uh, heavily dependent on a series of washing, imaging, and washing cycles, which tend to uh, become very labor intensive when multiple cycles of the sequencing protocol are to be used. Next slide, please. Therefore, the goal, goal of my project uh, was the creation of an automated fluid perfusion device known as a flow cell with precise temperature regulation and uniform fluid distribution of the uh, sequencing reagents. In order to tackle the issue of uh, the labor intensive processes, the entire pipeline was automated uh, using custom Python scripts that were written in house. The last bit that is yet to be uh, constructed is the development of an automated image pipeline, image analysis pipeline that interrogates uh, the confocal uh, microscopy images to infer the gene expression dynamics. Next slide, please. Once a flow cell was constructed, we validated the device using fixed human pluripotent stem cells that were stained for SOX2, which is a pluripotency marker. From the image on the left, uh, we can see the uh, DAPI stain, which shows us the in entire flow cell imaging area, which is roughly four to five times larger than any commercially available flow cell device. The SOX2 staining shows the highly reproducible data that we can obtain uh, for staining on a flow cell when compared to more established uh, pipelines, such as the 96 well plate format that is con con conventionally used for staining work of human pluripotent stem cell. Next, next slide, please. So for key takeaways from this project, I, uh, from my talk, I wanted to tell you now that we have a flow cell uh, pipeline that is fully automated and can execute different sequencing chemistries to infer the spatial location of gene expression changes. The next steps in this project involve the uh, automation of fluorescent in situ sequencing on human pluripotent stem cells, and then autonomously uh, uh, annotating through this data to infer gene expression dynamics. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to take your questions. Great, hey, thank you everybody. So give everybody a few minutes or a few seconds to type in their questions. And we'll start with Amanda. There's a question in the chat asking about um, what you suspect are other factors that would decrease the accuracy of the videos. Yeah, so with these videos, we had to take them with a mask due to multiple people um, being in the room. And we suspect that might have changed how the head uh, body segment was able to be identified. Great. And Arian, yes, Arian, um, this question looks to be about statistical analysis. Um, did you use linear regression to test whether or not the age affected um, those variables that you were looking at? Or was it correlation? So thank you for your question, Alex. So we just correlated the OMEN and OHIPA variables. We did not test prediction. We're still collecting more um, to increase our sample size. Um, the correlation of coefficients that were determined to be non-significant were you know, p-values greater than 0 0.05, and significance was determined to be p-values less than 0 0.05. Great. Question for Atishé. Also in the chat, um, how are you planning to implement the automated image analysis pipeline? So the uh, automated image analysis pipeline is currently uh, being uh, constructed on Python. So it's going to take in the confocal microscopy images, uh, perform a few pre-processing steps to remove background noise, and then perform a series of base calling in order to understand the gene sequences from these uh, confocal images taken during sequencing. Great, thank you. 
And I'll have a, I'll ask a question for Arden. Um, you talked about how the devices that are currently in the market are about fifty thousand um, dollars. With your in-house device, how much do you hope to decrease the cost down? Is it in the to the hundreds or a thousand or just anything below the fifteen k? Sure. So basically, the Arduino based uh, device that we built actually the whole entire thing cost about a hundred dollars, give or take. So it's such a substantial decrease from whatever is selling on the market at the moment. Awesome, great, thank yeah. you. All right, I'll turn it over back to Carmen. All right, David, take it away. All right, so hello everyone. I'm David from the Kazak Adapter Lab and my project pertains to the amino camouflage of red blood cells. So big thanks to Dr. Kazak Adapter, Hazel and the Withers Group for their support. Moving on to the next slide. So we know that blood type matching is extremely important for blood transfusion. So this transfusion of mismatched blood can cause severe complications. And our lab with the Withers Group have previously shown an enzyme pair that can convert the type A red blood cell to the O type by cleaving the A antigen. And we'll refer to these enzymatic converted cells as eco cells. But we also wanted to explore shielding minor antigens such as those of the RH group from immune recognition as this can also complicate transfusions. And to accomplish this, we grafted a molecule called polyethylene glycol or PEG to the cell surface with the theory being that this will shield minor antigens from antibody recognition. So my goal this summer was to combine these two modifications on A positive red blood cells and explore how this affected immune recognition and stability. Moving on to the next slide. Shown on the left, we assessed human IgG antibody binding through incubating red blood cells in donor serum of different blood types. And we scored this using clinically standard gel cards that contain antibodies that bind to human IgG with a score of zero and containing no IgG binding. And we also assessed the initial stability of these modified cells through determining hemoglobin in release that's, that's released immediately after modification using spectrophotometry. And moving on to the next slide. We also observed that across a total of 19 O positive serums, the cells modified with the ECO and PEG condition show dramatic decreases in IgG binding compared to the A positive and ECO cells, as they scored the most zeros in the anti IgG columns, as shown on the right, suggesting a greater level of evasion of the immune system. And moving on to the next slide. So the modified cells also present similarly in terms of stability compared to unmodified control A positive cells. On the left, the level of oxyhemoglobin is consistent between unmodified and modified cells, suggesting no changes in functionality. Percentage lysis was also slightly higher in the modified cells as shown in the middle here, but still very low at around 1%. And finally on the right, the ability of the modified cells to withstand osmotic pressure is consistent with unmodified cells as they then demonstrate a similar lysis for salt concentration relationship. And moving on to the last slide, we still have quite a lot to explore in terms of the long-term viability of these modified cells as a blood product, as we'd like to look at the level of lysis that occurs over long-term storage periods and the human serum. But our hope is that one day, this work can lead to reductions in blood shortages in various clinical settings and allow for blood that's universally transfused. Thank you all for listening. Great, thank you, that was fantastic. Next speaker, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm David. My project this summer was on the effect of mTASER plus on stem cell growth. This was done with the help of my supervisor, Priya Iwarima, in the Kiefer Lab. And I'd like to thank the School of Biomedical Engineering and the Center for Blood Research for hosting the event today and the program throughout the summer. Next slide, please. Stem cells can be used in regenerative medicine to treat millions and millions of people worldwide. Take, for example, diabetes, where we can make insulin producing cells from stem cells to treat patients. However, as seen in this figure here, the number of people affected by diabetes is expected to dramatically increase in the coming decades. And so it is clear that we will need to make a lot more stem cells for regenerative medicine. Next slide, please. But what is a stem cell? A stem cell is a cell that can make copies of itself or become other types of cells in our bodies. Stem cells are grown in media with specific stem cell nutrients and growth factors. MTSER1 is a widely used stem cell media, but this has recently been improved to a new version called MTSER+. Both of these media are sold by stem cell technologies. Next slide, please. For my project, we wanted to look at the different effect that MTZ1 and MTZ Plus can have on stem cells in the Kiefer lab. We did this by first preparing the cells for the experiment and then growing the cells for five days. Within those five days, one set of cells were fed with MTZ1 daily and another set of cells were fed with MTZ Plus every other day. 
We took old media samples each day. We took automated cell count and viability measurements on day three and five. And then we also looked at specific stem cell protein markers on day five using flow cytometry. And we repeated those experiments twice. Next slide, please. The figure on the left here is showing cell count over days of cell growth. At day three, there were slightly more cells in the M-teaser plus group compared to the M-teaser one. And this difference is more pronounced on day five, even with those restricted feeds. The figure in the middle here is showing cell viability over days of cell growth. The viability remained around 90% or higher for both conditions and for both repeats of the experiments. The figure on the right here is a representative flow cytometry plot, which shows that around or close to 100% of the cells maintained expression of two key stem cell protein markers. And this was consistent across both media conditions and both repeats of the experiment. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for MTSR plus in regenerative medicine? Well, this will give us more flexibility. And when we feed our cells, we can use less time or media, and we can also make more cells for regenerative medicine applications, such as in diabetes research. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. All right, our next speaker, please. Hi everyone, my name is Elijah, and I did my summer project in the Kiziki Dato Lab, and the title is Iron Chelating Polymer Adjuvants for Treatment of Bacterial Biofilm. Next slide. So bacterial cells are able to cluster into a structure called biofilm, and biofilms are about 10 to 1,000 times more resistant to antibiotics compared to their planktonic counterparts. Because of this, they are extremely difficult or almost impossible to eradicate once they have formed. Therefore, they also contribute to about 80% of chronic and recurrent microbial infections in the human body. Some important clinical concepts include medical devices associated infections and also leading cause of death in patients with cystic fibrosis. Next slide. So in order for bacterial cells to cluster into a biofilm, an important requirement for them is iron. And in this project, we are using an iron chelating polymer, HBEDS conjugated to HPG, to take away iron and lower its availability for the bacteria. As for our objectives, we wanted to determine whether we could use this iron chelating polymer as an antibiofilm agent, and also use it as an adjuvant or as a boost to increase the antibiotic effectiveness when we combine the two of them together. Next slide. As for the methods, the first step is culturing the bacterial strain. Once we have the bacterial suspension, we then dilute it with the media used to grow the biofilm, and then we seed each well of the 96 well plate. Once we have the preformed biofilms, we then apply our treatments, the antibiotic rifampicin and the iron chelating polymer. Once the biofilms are treated, we, we then perform our assay MTS accompanied by uh, fluorescent imaging. Next slide. So based on our data, we saw that the ICP-treated biofilms showed about 50% growth inhibition. And we could visually see this in the fluorescent imaging on the right, comparing the ICP-treated biofilm against the untreated biofilm. We also chose a sub-inhibitory concentration of rifampicin. And in combination with ICP, this sub-inhibitory concentration became inhibitory as it showed about 85% growth inhibition. Therefore, based on this data, we showed that the ICP acted as an antibiofilm agent, and it also acted as an adjuvant for rifampicin as it gave it the boost that it needed to become more effective, even at sub-inhibitory concentration. Next slide, please. Therefore, uh, since we saw that the polymer was effective against staph aureus biofilms, we also want to test it against more bacterial strains that also forms biofilms, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa E. coli. We also want to combine it with different antibiotics to see if we could achieve that synergy. And lastly, we have a library of different HPG HBITs conjugate with different molecular weights that we also want to test in the future. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks. And our last speaker for this group uh, is Emily. Hello, I'm Emily, and I'm from the Strenac Lab. Today, I'll be presenting my project on shaping the vaccine for chlamydia trichomatis. Next slide, please. Chlamydia trichomatis is a gram-negative bacterium that is pathogenic in humans. It is the leading cause of bacterial sexually transmitted infections across the world and can result in reproductive difficulties in both females and males. Despite the increasing infection rates every year, there's currently no vaccine against chlamydia trichomatis available. Therefore, the development of a vaccine is necessary to protect individuals from being infected by chlamydia trichomatis. Next slide, please. So what is a vaccine? Some vaccines contain an antigen, antigen which, can induce, uh, which can trigger an immune response in the host. 
On the right is a simple example showing how the shape of the antibody and the antigen are important in initiating the immune response. For this project, we aim to determine the structure of AMP-A. AMP -A is an outer membrane protein in chlamydia trichomatis, which can trigger an immune response in the host. Next slide, please. The workflow for my project is shown here. First, the AMP -A gene was cloned into a mutant strain of E. coli. Uh, second, after growing enough E. coli containing this gene, the expression of AMP -A was induced. Thirdly, AMP -A was purified so that we could specifically look at AMP -A during characterization. Steps two and three of this workflow were optimized to produce enough proteins for, uh, for characterization. Next slide, please. Here's an electron microscopy image of AMP-A that we obtained. Zooming into one, we can see that AMP-A assembles into groups of three and forms a pore in the middle. This is a good foundation to build more structural information on AMP-A, which can be achieved through other characterization methods. Next slide, please. In summary, the project workflow was optimized to produce enough AMP-A for characterization, and electron microscopy images reveal that AMP-A assembles into groups of three and forms a pore. The next step is to find the antibody partner of AMP-A and determine its shape to further aid vaccine development against chlamydia trichomatis. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well done all. Now we'll have our Q&A session for this group of four. So for David Chen, we have a question for you. When do you envision treating these red blood cells? Would this be done immediately prior to transfusion? And how complicated will the regulatory pathway be for both eco and PEG treatment? Yeah, so that's a good question. And um, in terms of um, when this would when this treatment would be done, um, cur the current results show that um, that uh, applying this treatment immediately does uh, does show a good immuno camouflage effect. But uh, I think um, in terms of like long term storage and um, as well as whether the immuno camouflage effect is retained after long term storage, that's we still need to do some more investigation on that before we can. Uh, and to see whether or not we can um, apply this treatment and then just leave it for a, a long period of time. Hopefully that answers your question. Great, thank you. And for Elijah, um, someone was wondering why did you see a higher signal for uh, rifampice? I don't remember how to pronounce that, <laughs> for the antibody compared to the no treatment control. Yeah, so good observation. Uh, it's rifampice and it's the antibiotic. Um, so I've mentioned that it's a sub-inhibitory concentration, but what's interesting about it is it's actually a stimulatory concentration as well. So it actually promotes biofilm growth, even though it's, about, it's an antibiotic and there are papers to support that. And what we found was that when we combine it with our um, polymer, that stimulatory effect was gone and was converted to become inhibitory instead. So that was pretty amazing. Great. Um, and so I, for uh, the other David, <laughs> So you were testing the two um, media, MTZR1 and MTZR+. Were you expecting to see different results on your specific stem cells compared to the stem cells that presumably stem cell technologies tested these two media on? Uh, no, I mean, they, we both tested them on pluripotent stem cells. So I don't think we were expecting to see uh, significant differences. We were expecting to see a slight difference at day three and then perhaps more at day five. Um, we did do restricted feeding, which stem cell technologies did their experiments. So that just shows that we can use less media to produce more cells. Right, fantastic. Which considering the price of these particular medias is great <laughs> and less personnel time to have to feed every day. Um, fantastic. And so um, for Emily, why was AMP A chosen instead of one of the other uh, antigens? Um. That's a great question. So for my project, we were collaborating. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm reading the comments. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for my project, we were collaborating with the Brenham Lab at the BCCDC and they're developing the, they're developing the vaccine uh, and they were interested in not bait. They were also interested in um, another protein that I also worked on, which was CT584, which is also another antigen that can induce a immune response in the host as well. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move on to our next set of four speakers. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, my name is Emmanuel and I was working under Dr. Conway for this summer on elucidating the relationship between CD248 and PDGF in type 2 diabetes. Next slide please. Type 2 diabetes is a common multi-system inflammatory disease where your sugar levels are dysregulated. And this comes with many complications such as altered adipogenesis or fat tissue formation and the development of vascular diseases. Next slide please. Associated with diabetes is a protein called CD248, which is found at high levels during adipogenesis and various vascular diseases. Most importantly though, a lack of CD248 has been found to protect against diabetes in mice. Interestingly, PDGF is another molecule known to participate in vascular diseases and also regulates adipogenesis. So because of this, we questioned whether CD248 regulates PDGF signaling pathways. Next slide, please. To test this, we use 3T3L1 cells, which are a model of preadipocyte or precursor fat cells, to show that CD248 and PDGF receptor alpha are co-localized. CD248 is shown in red, and PDGF receptor alpha is shown in green. And when these images are superimposed, you can see that these yellow-orange dots indicate that they overlap, supporting that there is likely a relationship between these two molecules. Next slide, please. Next, to see if this was a functional relationship, we evaluated whether PDGF signaling is affected by the reduction of CD248. We knocked down CD248 in the 3T3L1 cells and used a Western blot to look at the levels of AKT and ERK phosphorylation, which are both induced by PDGF signaling. Here we can see that when levels of CD248 are knocked down, there is a slight reduction in phosphorylated AKT and ERK levels, suggesting that CD248 does influence PDGF-induced signaling pathways. Next slide, please. And so what we can conclude is that there is likely a relationship between CD248 and PDGF, both of which participate in the progression of type 2 diabetes. Next steps would include determining how CD248 and PDGF receptor physically interact, what the physiological relevance of this interaction is, and hopefully in the end, this will lead to exploring CD248 as a potential therapeutic target for type two diabetes. Thank you. Great, next speaker, please. Hi, so I'm Eric Lyle. I'm from the Trupini Lab, and today I'm going to talk to you about bacteria, phages, and osmolality. Next slide. So the gut microbiome is absolutely critical to human health. It's important for our immune system, our digestive system, and our mental health. And at our lab, we focus on how osmotic stress, or the change in kind of solute concentration, can affect the microbiome. And we know this osmotic stress happens during chronic diseases like Crohn's or when we give out laxatives. From some of our previous studies, we know that when we deliver a laxative and, and change the osmolality in the gut, we can have huge effects on the bacteria. Um, and we can even eradicate certain species like S24-7. Next slide. There's one more thing we have to worry about in the gut and those are phages. Phages are like viruses specific to bacteria. They outnumber bacteria 10 to one. And interestingly, a lot of phages actually infect bacteria through osmotic channels. So knowing that bacteria are heavily affected by osmolality and knowing that phage has this link, we made a hypothesis. And that's that the combo of osmotic stress and phage is gonna drive bacterial evolution. Next. So our goal here was kind of to put bacteria and phage into a vial at a few different osmolalities and watch this evolve over a couple of weeks. This is really hard to do with conventional cell culture methods because you would have to passage the cells every day and you'd have little control over the phase of growth. So instead, what we did is we built an automated cell culture and using a Python control algorithm, every time the cell density gets too high, we dilute with fresh media. Next slide. A typical experiment kind of looks like a miniature pandemic. So at the beginning, I would inoculate with bacteria and phage, and they would enter an arms race where the bacteria would evolve to become resistant, and the phage would possibly counter with sort of like a, a new variant. 
Um, this would continue till the end. Next slide. So at the end of the experiment, I actually isolated the bacteria and measured their growth. Two interesting things we've had so far that I'm having some trouble replicating. First, if you evolve with phage, you have a significant growth advantage over evolving without phage. And the second thing we saw is if you evolve specifically at extreme osmolalities, very high or very low, you also have a growth advantage. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. All righty, next speaker. Um, hello, my name is Francesca Ferrasso. I am from the Castrop lab and my project is RNA therapy for thrombotic disorders. Next slide, please. So thrombosis is very common. It affects more than 100,000 Canadians every year, and unfortunately, more than 10,000 of them die. So currently, thrombosis is treated with anticoagulants, which they do decrease thrombosis, but at the same time, they may also increase hemorrhage risk. So clinicians often face difficult decisions when they have to balance the risk between thrombosis and hemorrhage. Next, please. So um, it has been found that factor 12 has a primary role in thrombus formation, but it does not have a primary role in hemostasis. So we thought if we can create an agent which decreases factor 12 levels, it could become a new way to manage thrombosis, and it could be a novel anticoagulant that does not have the risk of hemorrhage. Next slide, please. So the way that we went about this, so the reagent is an sRNA lipid nanoparticle. So an sRNA has the ability to specifically decrease factor 12 levels. And then the lipid nanoparticle acts as its carrier and is able to target the liver, which is exactly where factor 12 is synthesized. And lipid nanoparticles are safe and FDA approved. So we hypothesized that with this reagent, we would inject it in thrombotic disorder animal models, and we would see decreased levels of factor 12 and decreased thrombus formation. Next slide, please. Um, so we formulated this reagent, and then we injected it into mice, and then we collected tissue and blood to see the factor 12 levels. So we looked at factor 12 mRNA expression, antigen, and activity levels. And as you can see from the percentages on the slide, the factor 12 levels did decrease. So those are the percentages um, compared to untreated mice. Next slide, please. So we were able to see that um, the reagent that we made does decrease factor 12 levels. So the next step was to look at it's the anticoagulant potentiality of this reagent. So this is currently being tested um, in two thrombotic disorder animal models. One is at the Michigan State University and one is here at the University of British Columbia. And we're looking if this reagent does indeed lower the thrombus formation and if it can uh, become a novel way to treat thrombosis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker. Hello, uh, my name is Haley, and I've been working in Dr. Kota's lab. And today I'm presenting my work looking at mitochondrial DNA mutations in sorted lymphocytes in people living with HIV and not. Uh, next slide, please. So people living with HIV experience accelerated aging. They have a higher prevalence and an earlier diagnosis of age-related pathologies compared to HIV negative controls. Mitochondrial function also decreases as we age, uh, and this is caused by the accumulation of oxidative damage. Uh, this may also be why mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA accumulates mutations as we age. So there's a relationship between mtDNA mutations and aging, as well as between HIV and aging. But in this project, we want to further investigate the relationship between HIV infection and mtDNA mutations. Uh, next slide, please. So we're investigating this using a super precise sequencing assay. This assay allows us to detect a mutation occurring in as few as one in 500,000 base pairs. So we're sequencing a portion of the D-loop region of mtDNA. So the D-loop region is critical for mtDNA replication and transcription, and it is the portion of mtDNA with the most mutations. In this project, we are sequencing four cell subsets, uh, T helper cells, B cells, and two subsets of killer T cells, one old and unable to activate, and one younger subset. So this precise sequencing of sorted cells has never been done before and it is exploratory. So I cannot say which specific subsets we expect to be higher in HIV. However, we do hypothesize that there will be a higher mutation burden in the older killer T cells compared to the younger ones. 
Uh, this is just as we see an increase in mutation burden with physiological age. We also expect to see this with cellular age. Uh, we also expect that HIV will be associated with a higher mutation burden. Next slide, please. So we're still finishing up a full sequencing run. Uh, so today I will be presenting some preliminary data that we collected. Uh, this preliminary run was mostly done to look at the feasibility of using the sequencing assay for the different subsets. Um, this figure is a cool visual visualization of the mutations that we found. So one horizontal line across this figure shows one specimen's D loop. And every, everywhere that you see green, there is a mutation at that position. As you can see, we saw mutations in every single specimen. And this is pretty typical of what we've seen in previous runs of whole blood. Next slide, please. So this graph is showing low frequency mutation uh, burden per 10 KB for the different cell subsets. So all of the specimen are higher than the negative control, which shows us that the signal is real and that the assay works for these subsets. It appears that there are differences uh, between the mutation burdens in the different subsets. And I am very excited to see which trends continue when we add nearly 300 specimens to this analysis. Thank you. Great, thanks everybody. All right, give everybody another chance to put in their questions for our four summer students. Seeing lots of comments about great presentations, which I very much agree with. I'm learning a lot as well. All right, I guess I'll start with Manny. Um, curious to learn sort of um, whether you encounter any challenges working on your project with CD248. Yeah, I would definitely say so. Um, I guess some of the reagent based ones was just finding the right antibody that was more specific, um, but more specific to um, some of the experiments we were trying to do uh, working with primary cells, so cells that were um, extracted from the fat tissue of mice, so that we could see if there's an effect in the mice, uh, in the cells from mice, uh, in addition to the cell lines that we were using as a model. Um, they're a bit finicky, they can get <laughs> contaminated very easily, and so that was something that um, I had trouble with this summer. Thanks. And Eric, um, the doctor felt the experiments that you did with your phages and your bacteria. I'm kind of curious to know what kind of bacteria you worked with because you're studying the microbiota, which has lots and lots of different species of bacteria. Absolutely. So we're starting these experiments with kind of the low hanging fruit, if you would say. So we're starting it with E. coli and the T4 bacteria phage. Great, thank you. And Francesca, um, what are your next, um, so you talked about uh, your next steps in collaborating with various labs to um, figure out how to, whether your sRNA nanoparticle can lower formation of thrombosis or decrease thrombosis formation. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what those experiments look like? Um, yeah, so those collaborations have already started. Um, I just can't disclose which animal models, which thrombotic disorder animal models we are using, um, but we have already, I have already formulated and um, the, um, the studies are already started and hopefully we'll have results soon. Awesome. And finally, um, Haley, um, in terms of your projects, what are your next steps? Um, besides uh, doing a deeper dive on your data set? Uh, yeah, so we're mostly waiting for our data to come back. And since this is exploratory, we can definitely have like a few uh, further like sequencing assays to go off of the results. So if we see something interesting with the older versus younger CD, uh, so the T cells, then we'll maybe look at different markers of cellular aging and sequence those as well. Um, but yeah, I think those questions will definitely come after we analyze the next run. Great, awesome, thank you. All right, and we will move on to our final group of students for this session. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. You can, yes. Oh, okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Han and today I'm present about our project this summer, which is the customizable, flexible, 3D printed EEG cap and electrodes. Next slide, please. 
So as you know, contact sports um, such as ice hockey players usually encounter a high number of head impacts during the games. And research has proved that cumulative head impacts may lead to long-term brain changes like concussion. Monitoring brain changes by measuring the EEG during these impacts will hugely help us understand the accumulation mechanism. Thus, the project goal um, is to design an EEG cap for hockey players. Next slide. So you may wonder what EEG is. So it's basically a high temporal resolution method to record electrical activity of the brain. It can be non-invasive and that's the way we go with it. Um, EEG signal is small in amplitude, usually only microvolts. So it's very susceptible to surrounding noises such as 60 Hertz AC noise, EMG movements and internal noises from the EEG system. EEG is hard to be recorded and may be very uncomfortable to wear, um, especially during a long time in high impact and movement environments like hockey games. Next slide. So you can see in the pictures there, and I also have the cap next to me, if you can see it. Um, so that green cap is our EEG cap. It's very flexible. It's made by 3D printing with the FDM Brewster printer with TPU 85A Ninja Flex filament. And we actually also um, develop our own electrodes, maybe a bit hard to see. But anyway, we have um, all types like gel, dry, and paste electrodes. And actually, when we print the cap, we print them flat on the printing bed, and then we bend and connect them back together by melting the end parts. Next slide. So the system was tested with shooting wires, all of our EEG electrotypes, the open DCI siphon board during resting state, which means the participant just sitting still, trying to think of nothing and doing like eye close, eye open. And also we test during movement, like in the video there, um, participant will walk or run at some specific speed or do some jump movements. And then we measure the EEG at the same time so that we can verify that our system can still get good quality signal during those movements. Next slide. So in conclusion, our cap kind of works. Um, for sure, we will need more tests to verify that, um, but it does work for at least three hours in high impact and movement environment. The huge advantages of this new system is that the cap is very flexible, so much more comfortable to wear, um, easier to make custom head size, because you can just change the cat um, file dimension based on the head dimension and then print it out. Um, easier to wash, time saving to make, the printer does everything and can have different stretchability and hardness by just changing the printer settings. So as mentioned, for sure, further improvements and testing will be done. Thank you for listening. Do you have any? Oh, if you that. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. Hello everyone, my name is Hoan and I work at the Kim Lab. So the research focus of our lab is on platelets and my summer project is on platelet signaling during endocytosis. Next slide, please. So platelets are essential for blood clot formation. Their activation are controlled by the actin cytoskeleton, which are the structural backbone of platelets. The cytoskeleton allows them to undergo a shape change and uptake molecules through a process called endocytosis. So previously, our lab has discovered that the lack of gelsolin, which is an actin suffering protein, is associated with altered platelet functions. Specifically, the endocytosis uptake has been compromised. However, we don't know exactly how the actin cytoskeleton controls platelet activation, so my project aims to understand the signaling pathways controlled by gelsolin um, during platelet endocytosis. Next slide, please. So to understand this, we use genetically altered mice lacking the protein gelsolin. So the mice without gelsolin are referred to knockouts and the mice that have gelsolin are referred to as wild types. So knocking out gelsolin demonstrated a decreased endocytosis or uptake of cargo. So as a next step, we wanted to understand whether the integrin signaling pathway was affected or not. So this could be done by comparing the concentration of the phosphorylated proteins in our wild type and knockout mice. So for example, as shown here are the integrin alpha 2A beta 3B receptor and its consequent proteins FAK and SRC. So phosphate groups are added to the proteins during activation. So if this pathway is controlled by gelsolin, we expect to see decreased phosphorylation of the proteins in knockout as compared to the wild type. 
Next slide, please. So using Western blots, we can have a qualitative analysis of our protein concentration. The thickness of each band will indicate the amounts of phosphorylated protein. Our samples were induced for different time points using ADP, and fibrinogen was added as a cargo for endocytosis uptake. So by focusing our um, attention on the top row of each group, you can see that the thickness of the bands are very similar. So this means that for each treatment group, the amount of phosphorylated proteins are consistent and no difference is observed. The bottom row then shows the loading control, which reflect the total amount of proteins. The equal thickness also represents equal loading of our samples. So next slide, please. So um, as shown in the previous slide, it can be concluded that the intergen alpha-2 beta-3 pathway was functioning properly, and the FAK and SRC activation are gel cell independent. Moving on from here, more research will have to be done to investigate the alternative pathways as gel cell is, um, to save if gel cell is in foster regulating plate synthesis. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Next speaker, please. Hello. Hi everyone, uh, my name is James, uh, and this is my project on the validation of human islet calcium regulated genes and subtype markers. Uh, before I really begin, a uh, big thank you to our funding and donors and to Dr. Francis Lin, uh, Samantha Yoon, and everyone in the Lin Lab for giving me this opportunity. Uh, next slide, please. So the pancreas has many functions. Um, one of them is an endocrine or hormonal function. Uh, it has islets that carry out this function. Islets can be further subdivided into alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells, which secrete glucagon, insulin, and then somatostatin respectively. These help regulate blood glucose levels in the body. And one of the big uh, signaling mechanisms is calcium signaling for this glucose mechanism. Uh, next slide, please. Hello. Oh, thank you. All right, so uh, before I came into the lab, there was this huge project, a uh, human islet single cell RNA sequence project that tried to identify all the different calcium regulated genes inside the project, uh, inside human islets. Um, what they found was a possible, possible markers for beta and alpha cell subtypes. So you can see these are alpha cells uh, on, on the left, you can see, and on the uh, beta cells on the right and that second figure there. Um, one gene that was found to be especially interesting was PCDH7. Now, PCDH7 was found to be in beta cells primarily, but not just in any beta cells, but beta cells that had a lot of enhanced function, a lot of insulin. Um, MPAS4 is another gene that was studied in the Lin lab before, and it's known to be a very highly regulated calcium gene, uh, calcium regulated gene. Um, both these genes are very highly expressed in PCDH7, and uh, both both these genes are very highly expressed in the beta-1 and the beta-3 clusters. Um, next slide, please. Now, one part of my project was doing a lot of qPCR to, see, to show calcium-regulated gene expression. So this is one of NPAS4. Um, all the low conditions are marked at 1, and all the positive and negative conditions are then relative to that low condition. So for example, in the H2308 donor, the positive condition is around six times more than the low condition for MPAS4 expression. Um, you can see that the positive condition has a lot of upregulation, but the negative condition relatively has a, some sort of variation where perhaps the calcium blocker didn't really work as well as we wanted it to. But we can sort of see that, yes, there is a positive induction and there is a negative deregulation of, uh, of this expression of MPAS4. Next slide, please. Uh, the second big stream of my project was immunofluorescence. Uh, here in all three of these conditions, really, you can see a green PCDH7, a yellow NPAS4, and red insulin that are overlapping very well. And this overlap provides support for the subtypes that have been shown by the, uh, the data set before and for the fact that PCDH7 marks cells with enhanced insulin and uh, enhanced beta cell function. Uh, next slide, please. So my next steps are, I'm just gonna be getting more human islets as they come in. I'm gonna do more RNA isolation and qPCR them for further calcium regulated genes so that these can be characterized based on the data, data set that was uh, derived before. And my second stream again is I'm going to be looking at patterns that are expected from the data set and seeing at the protein level with immunostaining to see if these genes overlap. And um, yeah, with this kind of information, we can really characterize the uh, the nature of healthy islets in the body and how they express their proteins and how we can see them when they're regulating properly or when they're not regulating properly. Um, it's just going to be a lot of good information in the future for uh, islet biology in general. And that was my presentation. Thank you.
Great, thanks, James. Next speaker, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Janelle Schwab. I'm an undergraduate in Nika Shakiba's lab, and I'll be presenting on nonspecific RNA cleavage in CRISPR Cas13 in mammalian cells. Next slide. So being in a scientific discipline, we've all come across CRISPR gene editing systems at some point, which are praised for their ability to cleave very specific regions of genetic material. This is usually DNA, but most recently there's been a surge of RNA targeting technologies. This relies on a Cas protein being directed to a specific region of genetic material and cleaving it, which is mediated by making a guide RNA complementary to this region of interest. And this will act as a, ve a vehicle to take the Cas protein there. This feature of specificity is generally conserved between Cas proteins. Next slide. However, some Cas proteins vary in this feature. For example, Cas13D is a Cas protein that targets RNA instead of DNA, and it's known to cleave the target as expected, but then kind of go crazy and cleave random sequences, which is called collateral cleavage. This is reported extensively in bacteria through in vitro work, but we want to explore this effect in mammalian cells, especially since there has been conflicting reports on this and many CRISPR-Cas applications are therapeutic. So this would pose an issue for that. Next slide. To test this, we transfected two plasmids, one that had Cas13D, um, a green transfection control, and two guides, one of two guides that targeted MK2. The other plasmid had the target MK and an untargeted fluorescent protein tag BFP, which would allow us to see if the levels of the untargeted protein were decreased on top of the decreased levels of the target. We quantified this using flow cytometry. Next slide. From the mean fluorescence intensity of red and blue, we did see collateral cleavage activity. The left panel shows the expected on-target activity, um, where on the left side of the panel is the initial levels of fluorescence with inactive casutine, and once wild type Cas13 D is introduced on the right side of the panel, the fluorescence levels are decreased. This is because both guides target um, the red fluorescent protein. However, we see the same effect with the blue fluorescence levels where the initial levels on the left side of the right panel um, are decreased when Cas13 D is introduced, even though these guides were not targeting um, tag BFP. This was identified as collateral and not off-target effects since it only occurred when the target was also present. This clearly has implications for researchers who would like to use cas d as a precise tool, especially in human contexts. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And now we have the Q&A session for this group of speakers. So, um, for uh, Hoan, there's several, a couple of questions uh, about whether gelsol and knockout mice have any bleeding or clotting abnormalities. And then sort of in relation to that, is there, are there any diseases that are known in which gelsolin is not um, expressed at normal levels? Thank you for the question. So I'll first address um, the first question. And according to our previous research in our lab, we found that clotting and dense granulose sec secretion are accelerated in no mice. And I personally am not too sure if there's any um, disease associated with um, the lack of gelsolin, but gelsolin is a cytoskeleton protein. So that's why we chose it for our research goal. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, okay, and for Han, what other applications do you imagine that this EEG cap can be applied to besides high impact sports? Um, and sort of relatedly, what will you do with the data that's collected following the use in high impact sports? Will you have players wear these? Um, is the vision to have players wear these uh, all times at all times in every game to monitor head impacts over time? Or what, what's the vision? <laughs> I guess is what I'm asking. Oh, maybe she's gone. Okay, well, we can move on for now. Um, for Janella, so now that you have observed um, non-targeted cleavage of these uh, things, what are the next steps that you hope to um, do with this information? I think a next step, um, it would be very useful to try to observe this cleavage in endogenous transcripts 
especially because that's where it would become most relevant and also um, it would be more accurate of what would be observed inside the cell since transfected transcripts usually have a much higher copy number um, than endogenous ones. Right. And it, there's been like half of the conflicting reports have been on um, like transfected transcripts or transcripts that, that has been introduced in a stable cell line, but the other half are in endogenous transcripts. So that would be very interesting to look at next. Right. Excellent. Okay. Um... And for James, did you encounter any um, difficulties and challenges um, when performing your project this summer? Uh, yeah, so the um, immunofluorescence can be a little bit tricky, especially when sometimes like you you get conflicting results when um, you you expect that the antibody that blinded to certain things overlap exactly with another antibody. So you can sort of realize that the first antibody isn't really binding what you want it to. So you have to change the antibody and the concentrations and really do a lot of um, like, like uh, test, test and guessing things to see how things are characterized really. Right. Okay, um, that is great. And I think now we will move on to our first, our second uh, break. And so- oh, uh, Carmen, before we do that, I just wanted to mention to everyone that our next CBR event is uh, shown on the slide here. We have our Earl Davies Symposium coming up on Tuesday, November 2nd. We're going to try to do this as a mixed uh, in-person and virtual event, assuming that um, our fourth wave isn't going to get totally out of control. And we will be at Robson Square, where we normally hold the Earl Davy and the Norman Bethune Symposia. And uh, just keep an eye on the notices that come out from the CBR. So thanks and enjoy your half an hour of freedom. <laughs> Great. So I'd like to thank everybody, all the um, presenters from the first um, set here. Those were fantastic talks and I learned a lot. And we shall now break until 1245. We'll um, resume promptly uh, then to hear the rest of our summer students speak. Thank you for your attention, everyone, and see you at 1245.